Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Midsummer Scream and our feature presentation, Frightful Attraction Design for Theme Park Audiences. Very often, a common emotion designed into theme park attractions is that of fear. But, just how much fear is fun? And when does fear cross the line? Becoming terror. Today, we will hear from four theme park entertainment icons as they discuss the art of attraction design. Please welcome to the stage, Disney legend and themed entertainment lifetime achievement award recipient, Tony Baxter. President and Creative Executive of the Hatima Group, Phil Hedema. <laughs> President and CEO of 42 Entertainment, Susan Bonds. <laughs> and your host for this afternoon's discussion, founder of Theme Park Adventure and Creative Director of Midsummer Scream, Rick West. Well, hello. <laughs> Deja vu. Are you excited? Yeah! Thank you guys. Thank you guys for coming out. Uh, first of all, these guys helped us in a pinch. I, I called these guys up like, what, three weeks ago and said, we need somebody here, and they, they all stepped up. So give them a hand for jumping in here in the Midsummer Street. Awesome. So we're going to get right into this, because this hour is going to go really, really fast. We are here talking about frightful attraction design. These guys have designed a few attractions in their lifetimes, and uh, some of them I'm sure your favorites, and a lot of them. So when you guys go to theme parks, there really are two formulas when you're on an attraction. You're either laughing or you're screaming because something has gone horribly, horribly wrong, right? So what we're going to do today is we're going to discuss what went horribly, horribly wrong in these attractions to make them some of the greatest dark rides of all time. You guys down for that? Yeah! All right. We're going to start with Tony Baxter. So the one question that I will ask each of you as we start, growing up, we're going to go back, growing up, what were the, uh, what was the favorite dark ride or scary dark ride that really made an impression on you guys that followed then years later as you became designers? Wow, that's a ringer, huh? Yeah. Um, I could be politically correct and say Snow White. Do we want politically correct? <laughs> yeah. So it isn't Snow White ride. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Boy, down here at the Pike, there was a thing that had a dead body inside of it. Yes. It was made into an audio animatronic figure, and that got in the press. That was pretty scary. Um, but I think the one for me was in Budapest, when it was a uh, communist country, so they could violate the clearance envelope. And it was a trip to hell, dark red. And the, the objects, the devils and things that came out at you, uh, literally, they were on a kind of a lever thing that came right into the clearance envelope, so the light would come on and Wow! Right there, in front of your uh, face. And, you know, I sat through that entire thing kind of with the cage of hands blocking my, my path. So that would, that would have to definitely be the, the killer. Now, also, you, when you were a teen, you were working at Disneyland and uh, Haunted Mansion, right? Yeah. Uh, I snuck into the Haunted Mansion and got arrested by Disney. Police. Now you're in trouble. <laughs> We stood by the ball watching that head when it was like the most miraculous thing you could imagine, seeing Adam Leota for the first time. And we were walking around that, you know, circular space there, and I got the tap on the shoulder, and uh, we're going over to security right now, please. And, I and they something. said, you're never going to amount to anything. No, I said, I'll never, I'll never do that again. I will never get inside a Disney attraction again. <laughs> Boy, did he show them, huh? So now, your first big attraction, your first attraction was Big Thunder. Yeah. 
And the backstory of Big Thunder also deals with supernatural. The reason that the trains are going nuts is because the, the mining camp was built on an ancient Indian burial ground. Isn't that the backstory? Well, I think you made a mistake in making this a 35, 40 minute panel. I mean, each one of these things, fear has so many different avenues. Yeah. From how characters are designed to the atmospheres that yeah. you go through, the scale of the space, big, small, all over the map. And we could do an essay on every single one of those. Every day, yeah. all day, right? But basically, when you're dealing with speed like that, you just have compression and opening of space and putting people in altered you know, perspectives that they don't normally find themselves. Yeah, that's great. And then, so, Phantom Manor at Disneyland Paris. Yeah. Hey, by the way, if you haven't been there, go to uh, Google the site for the Viennese Symphony Orchestra. They took John Debney's score and blew it out as a big orchestral thing yeah. for a gala New Year's Eve. Yeah, beautiful. That is, I think, the most awesome part of that, but it's a cultural thing. We put far less story in that because the Europeans, especially the French, like to create their own story. So you have American friends that go over there and say, well, I didn't get it. It was too loose and whatnot. The French people are very protective of it. It's, uh, it was a, an accommodation to things that we don't normally have to think about in America. Yeah. Well, it's a gorgeous attraction, and it was also the last thing that Vincent Price did. Right? Yes. However, as you know, we got talked out of using his narrative because there's five languages in Europe that visit that park. So we took it out. I think I, today I would have kept it. Because it's an American attraction with a guy that speaks with an American accent, French. And I think that would have been just like how we like to hear Europeans in movies yeah. speak, and it would have worked just fine. Yeah, perfect. Beautiful. All right, well, we're going to move to our next contestant, Gary Goddard, ladies and gentlemen. So we're a long way from, from Florida, but certainly there are a lot of fans of Ghostbusters, yes? Let's hear about that, but I also want to hear from you as well about what, what ride impressed you as a youngster. And it was a dark ride that, that made an impression on you. Eighth grade, uh, The Haunted Mansion. Haunted Mansion. Was, much, much like, I think I wrote that again and again and again trying to figure out, because unlike Tony, I did not jump out of the car or sneak in the back. <laughs> I just went over it again and again. I kept leaning, you know, to see, so I could figure out how the ghosts were done. I saw one of the hands come by down there, and then I got the projector, and I figured all that up for about, I don't know, six times, seven times. And, uh, but that, I think that was, you know, a big motive. Pirates of the Caribbean, Haunted Mansion, both were, uh, I, you know, when, if you grow up in, I grew up in Santa Barbara, so we're, we go, you know, once a year, and uh, I kind of grew up on Disneyland. So um, those, those were very, uh, very inspirational. Those things, for their time, were just incredible. Really I think for all time, yeah. 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 And so when you became a designer and worked on Ghostbusters, can you tell us a little bit about Ghostbusters? Uh, well, uh, we were working on the Florida project, and uh, Jay Stein, who was head of the whole thing, there wanted a Ghostbusters attraction. And what immediately came to mind was something that would obviously use Pepper's Ghost. And then as we started to really talk about it, well, if we're going to do it, let's do it with live actors, and, and let's make it the biggest Pepper's Ghost ever done, and let's make it interactive. Let's figure out how to make those beams look like they're actually coming from the, uh, the weapons, and, and we, uh, we just started dreaming this thing up, and it was uh, a pretty amazing, pretty amazing attraction with a lot of uh, first-time things. The biggest one was we used UV lasers for the first time. UV lasers are used for medicine. It took us like three or four or five months to get an approval to put it in a public space because, you know, you can't see a UV laser, so if it hits you in the eye, you get blinded, you don't even know that you were hit in the eye. It's just... It's just so we had to have a lot of safety systems in place to pull that off, but uh, a lot of the effects that you see, the reflections under the glass, the glows, the auras, the, the, the plasma beams, all that stuff, that's all a, a UV laser exciting uh, whatever paints and spots and stuff we had on the balcony above you. So you using, using basically the Haunted Mansion technology that so fascinated me when I was young, we did a much bigger version, and instead of putting the ghosts underneath you, we put everything above you on the balcony that you're unaware of, and then we uh, timed everything with the live actors on stage to, to make it all work. But that thing used everything. It used uh, animatronics and uh, uh, projections and uh, laser effects, and uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a challenge, but uh, yeah, it turned out great. And uh, Monster Plantation was an attraction you did too, <laughs> yeah? Well, that's interesting because when I left Imagineering, I was there at Imagineering when Tony was there, and I, I, I came in as a show designer, and so I got to work directly when I was about 20, 
four, I think, with you know Albertino and Mark Davis and, and Herb Ryman and Claude Coase and all of those guys. And Tony and I were kind of the junior junior guys at that point. Tony, by the way, Tony is like a certified genius, and he was then. It was amazing the stuff that he was doing. Um, and um, so Albertino had been forcibly retired, and so Six Flags actually came to him. They wanted a new attraction. They didn't know what it would be. And Al came to me because he knew I had my little company I just started. Because Al was like, look, I don't want to, I'm just me, I'm, I'm semi-retired. But, you know, let, let's go talk to the kid. I was a kid to all those guys. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, we did that. And, the, and we were the first major attraction. There was 132 animatronic figures in that thing when it opened. And uh, we were the first attraction that attempted to kind of do something on a Disney scale on a very, very, very reduced budget. Uh, but what's cool is we got to go in and redo it uh, in 2007, I think, or 2008. And what we added was we re, we re, uh, you know, we did new fur, new feathers, new paint, new everything. We added some sets. We made everything better. But we added a whole layer of 4D effects. So there's wind effects and there's mist effects, there's fog effects, there's smells. There's... So we added a whole other layer to it, which I think actually made it more vibrant. But that attraction now is going on its third generation of, you know, parents who brought children, those children know, and then they're growing up and they're bringing their children. So, yeah, that's pretty cool that it's it's still around after all these years. Yeah. And then there was this this little little scale attraction called Terminator 2 3D. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One of the greatest films ever. That was the project that uh, I think even Phil at first didn't believe in uh, for a little bit. They were like, what? We did 3D? And, and uh, but uh, yeah, that was that was that was an amazing thing. I got the assignment to create a show. I'll try and tell this very fast. So Jay says I want to put a stunt show in the Conan Theater. And by the way, I did the Conan show. Yes, yeah, Conan. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I want to do this, uh, a, a, a Terminator show, a stunt show in there. So I'm thinking stunt show, stunt show, stunt show. And I get the assignment. I get the laser disc. It was in those days, laser disc guys. Yeah. And uh, I start watching the movie, and I realize if you really look at at Terminator 2, and we had to make it Terminator 2 because contractually it couldn't be Terminator. It had to be based on T2. So uh, I suddenly realized it's really, I mean, Jim is amazing, but it's four incredible chases in four different places. And I'm thinking, how are you going to create that energy on stage in a stunt show? And the, 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 the breakthrough was when I got off of the word stunt show. So for three weeks, I'm trying to come up with something, and I'm going to have a meeting with Jade, and, you know, and I got nothing except, you know, because I keep thinking it's a stunt show. <laughs> It's going to be some guy in a tinfoil outfit, you know, taking a shot at a very bad uh, Arnold look-alike. And it's going to be awful. So I'm thinking, oh my god, this is just, this is... And, uh, and then I, um, I used to teach theater classes. So there's a book called Yellow Spallings. It's for improvisation for the theater. She had the magic gift. If you could do anything, what would you do? And so, like, two nights, three nights before the deadline, I mean, Jay, I was like, what could I... Okay, well, if... What if, I say, what if the, the, uh, the T-1000 could come out of the screen like that? And, and that led to what if the motorcycle could come out of the screen, which led me to 3D, which led me to a whole idea, and I worked it out literally in 48 hours, the, wow. the basic beats, and I got with Jay and said, well, Jay, first of all, this isn't exactly a stunt show. It'll have some stunts, but it's, it's something different. It's 3D, it's live actresses, and I gave him the three, three big J-bangs, like, you know, the big moments, the motorcycle coming out of the screen. Yeah. By the way, all three of those moments, we're in the final show, even though, you know, and it was the motorcycle, it was the head coming out of the screen, and it was the, at that time, when the screens opened, it was going to be all, it was be all around you, you know, so. I've also learned over the years, you, you, you design something way out here knowing it's going to be pulled back, but even when it gets pulled back, what you're left with is still enough to have a great show. So, anyway, that was the genesis of that, and then things like from there, we got into development, it was, a, it was difficult because uh, Karelka, who had made the movie, was bankrupt. And getting the rights was a whole. You got to get the Gail Ann Hurd. You had to get the James Cameron. And uh, uh, the best story is the Jim Cameron story. So I'll do that one. And that's it. So this this will be good. So we got the approvals from Gail Ann Hurd. We got the approval from what was left of Corelco. And everyone always said, "Well, what does Jim say? If, if Jim's in, we love it. If Jim Gail Ann Hurd, if Jim's in, we love it." So the big day comes for the Jim meeting. We're in one of the basement uh, rooms in the Black Tower. And uh, it's uh, Sid Scheinberg and Jay Stein, Barry Epson, and myself. And we're waiting there. And uh, Cameron's late, but he finally gets there. And we have, I mean, we have storyboards over the walls. We have every beat, act one, act two, act three, everything. And so I take Jim through the whole thing. It's probably a good 30 minute presentation through every single thing. And uh, <clears throat> at the end, Jim's just quiet. 
doesn't say anything. Then he gets up and he starts looking at the storyboards. First thing he says is, these boards are pretty good. Who did these boards? He's a young guy, great pro. He's a new guy, but we think he's really good. Blah, blah, blah. He goes, and there was awkward silence, so I tried to, you know, you want to fill the awkward silence? I said, well, you know, he goes, so I shut up. And he looks and he goes, you know, when I was driving over here, I was thinking, who the, who the, who these guys think they are, you know, thing, you know, taking my property, and I was fully prepared to say, no way, whatever it is you've done, no way. And then he went, but, to say, this is, uh, this is pretty good. Says you got the mythology right, you got the story right. I like this whole 3D thing. I I I like the whole thing. And then he says, not that I can't make it a little better. <laughs> well, I'd say it was uh, pretty damn good, right, guys? Did you? Jurassic Park, we got Men in Black, Alien Attack. An amazing dark ride. Why don't we talk about that? And then also we'll go back to your childhood too and talk about your favorite scary dark ride. Well, I think I'm like Gary. I'm a native Southern California kid. Disneyland opened about the time I was born and the Haunted Mansion has always been like, and still is in my mind, the best dark ride ever. Amazing. Yeah. So then you grew up and uh, started making, grew up, right? And then started making attractions, mm -hmm. right, for a living. And uh, so let's talk about, let's talk about Men in Black, Alien Attack. Well, um, Universal wanted to add another big attraction. We needed to do something that was different than everything else we had. And we wanted to try something that pushed the envelope of interactivity a little bit. Um, so started designing this attraction. And we really wanted to push the vehicles and do something nobody had ever done before. So um, uh, I think, you know, Tony talked about there's a lot of different ways to do scary. And I don't really think Men in Black is a particularly scary attraction. It is a family-friendly scary yeah. attraction. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when you're in the theme park business, you live and die by capacity. And I think one of the, one of the biggest things that is useful in physical storytelling is intimate space as opposed to big space. Tony mentioned that too, compression expansion. Um, and the thing we found out in Men in Black was we had these great vehicles that were interactive that actually spin on command and all this kind of stuff. And working all that was hugely technically difficult, but the ride envelope with two of those vehicles going down next to each other really became like the 405 freeway. Um, so trying to keep the scenery in and keep the experience contained around that, um, particularly in the giant monster at the end, which ended up kind of bigger than a flip hanger. Yeah, it was um, awesome. <laughs> Still was awesome. Um, was, uh, so we pushed a lot of technical boundaries in that ride as well as just having a lot of fun with it. Sure. Trying to make it more funny than scary. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, of course, Jurassic Park, great attraction. <laughs> the dinosaur is scary. The T-Rex is scary. That T-Rex has more uh, more forces on it than a 747, I think, you know, coming up the it's, it's huge. Gary, Gary and I go back a long way, and, and you know, that was originally Gary's concept, too, I, I have to say. Yeah, the, uh, um, the, the big moment was, is that moment which we really worked on, where he's actually supposed to come through the waterfall. He did originally. I don't know if he still does. He, 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 he did it first. He probably did it once really, really good. You know, you know what we try and do? We try and take the expectations where we like, I like, good magic trick. When I know what they're expecting, you, you want to you wanna then, you know, surprise. So the idea was, you, you're focusing on the fall, you know you're going to go down. You're not focusing on something's going to come out of that waterfall. And that was the original gag. Right as it comes out of you, bang, you go down, right there. Which I think is something we try and do all the time. I mean, you all know that when you design a haunted house, it's misdirection. Oh, yeah. Chance you can. yeah, absolutely. So then going from big scary dinosaurs, you recently had an attraction open in Korea, mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, Dragon's Go Go Wild? No, don't it's ask Shane. why. It's, oh my god, the name is amazing, right? It's an English translation of a Korean name, I think. Yeah. So going from big scary dinosaurs to family-friendly dragons. 
How did you guys approach that? And no, you, you knew right away it was going to be a family-friendly attraction like that? Yeah, it was definitely a kid's attraction and a very short timeline. So um, we designed a whole new family of dragons. And it's, I, you know, one of the things that I think Gary was talking about, G2 3D, increasingly as I'm in this business, anytime you can blur the boundaries between one medium and another one, you can have 3D and physical sets. We did this in Spider-Man, I think, to really tremendous effect, where you don't know where the film starts, the sets. That's where the real magic happens, almost without question, you know, um, because then once you once you break that reality, you can actually cheat in places, and the audience doesn't know it because they've already released that suspension of disbelief to a level that's that's pretty exciting. So in this ride, we combined media and animatronic figures, being very careful to keep them. Stylistically, even the animation and the media, so that it didn't blur the lines. You know, there's too many attractions where there's an animatronic figure here, and then animation over here that's full motion and everything, and it's like, well, those are from two completely different worlds. So, trying to keep a consistency of vision is really key to to making the experience seamless. Well, it came out really great. It's a beautiful it's, it's ride. A really sweet attraction. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right, Susan Bonds. We're going to keep the really, really scary one until the end. So, you worked on this little attraction at Disneyland called Indiana Jones Adventure, Temple of Dream But first, God, I jumped the gun every damn time. What was the ride growing up that made the biggest impression on you? Um, well, you know, I think having, I went to Walt Disney World, because um, I grew up in Georgia. Uh, in the second and fourth grade, and I think, I hope it's not too revealing to say that Mr. Toad's Wild Ride is here. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> you know, because uh, you just weren't expecting it. And, you know, I think what I started to notice then is that these mechanics, there's certain mechanics that work every time. Uh, when I went on the Haunted Mansion in the fourth grade with my sister, she was younger than, than me. She cried during the, during the entire attraction. So I was, and people, so much so that people were offering in other cars to come and help us. But um, it really is so disconcerting how when you, you know, come out of the instrument room, you're going backwards through that hall, right? And the doors are getting scarier and scarier. And very disconcerting, so much so that when you go down into the graveyard, you're just off balance. And so I think that um, being an engineer from Georgia Tech. Um, I was very, very interested in the mechanics of what it was that was really putting you in this uncomfortable position. And, um, and that's why when I came back from a career in aerospace, my first attraction, I was assigned to Tony's portfolio. Thank goodness. Uh, my first attraction was the build as the first truly scary Disney attraction. And I can honestly say, and I guess it's a badge, I'm the only one up here that's had a ride that caused children to scream and cry so much so that they closed the attraction. <laughs> so, there you have it. We're, we're so gonna get into this. Oh, that's the Pandora's box right there. But really, it was the idea was this mechanic that made you very, very, very uncomfortable. Did anybody go on the Alien Encounter before? Yeah. So the idea that you, because there was a lot of thought into it, so the, obviously the main technology was binaural sound, so we needed to keep you in a certain place where your head was in a certain place so you could get the, the main effect from the speakers. And we went around and around and around on like what kind of restraint to put on people. And you know, we're talking about seat belts, and we're talking about different things. We finally came up with this roller coaster restraint because the idea would be you cannot get out of it. And I mean like when the lights go out, and you're, you're literally sitting just for that moment. It's like, it's like when you're on an airplane and something happens and you go from being just a single person to now we're all in this together. It was kind of like that moment. It's like the lights are off and we can't get out of these chairs. So like there was a definitely a mechanical aspect of that show that was, it was designed to make you really, really, really uncomfortable. And if you know the history of that attraction, uh, it was first designed to be inspired by Alien, which was a pretty scary movie. I think I don't think I've ever seen the whole movie, and most of it I've watched with my ears plugged up. 
Um, you know, but I mean, I think we have to say that was a scary movie. Um, and the idea was, it was a pretty grim story at the beginning. Do you remember that first alien that Andy Gaskell, who was the art director on right. The Lion King? He had worked on Watcher in the Woods when it had an unbelievable ending. I think it might be a bonus feature on that. Right. Uh, but it was the most amazing creature that nobody ever saw. And I said, Andy, could you recreate that? And we did it. And then everyone looked at it and said, nobody can see No that. way. Yeah. yeah. Not trapped in a chair. Yeah, Disneyland. That's not that. <laughs> And really, as you guys know, your imagination is much worse than if we really showed you something. So the idea is you're only getting glimpses, you know, it's that strobe light of like, what is that? And then you're hearing things, but mostly you're feeling things behind you and drooling on you and breathing on you. And the subwoofers were repurposed and like, so you're feeling these heavy, heavy footsteps. And then the water on the back. When the the water on the back here. So it was really, but the whole the whole thing was made that much worse because you were trapped, and that was that was the basic idea behind it. So uh, a funny story back when I Theme Park Adventure is uh, 22 years old this summer, and uh, <laughs> way back way back when um, one of the first big things we covered was the creation of Indiana Jones at Disneyland. And as I was writing about Indy all the time, I was uh, I very often calling Susan and Tony at WDI, probably way, way too much, <laughs> and um, asking them questions because I wanted to make sure that we had all the facts right and everything. And I had mentioned to Susan, I didn't know, you probably don't even remember this, but this was lesson number one for me in this industry. So uh, I had mentioned to Susan that I had just come back from Walt Disney World. And she said, oh, did you, did you go on Alien Encounter? And I said, yeah. I did. And she said, well, what did you think about it? And I said, well, I said, first of all, I, I don't know what the hell they were thinking putting that in the Magic Kingdom. <laughs> uh, Mistake number one. Well, putting, putting it in Tomorrowland, it, it's like terrifying and don't move, don't move, it's right behind you. And this hot air and drool, and kids are losing their mind, moms are crying, dads are like, no, I'm putting a hot dog in. And, I was just like, I had no idea what the hell were you guys thinking, you know, and so I'm saying this and there's silence and then Susan says, oh, that was my attraction. <laughs> Lesson number one. It, it was wonderful. It would have worked really well in like MGM Studio Tours. I, if, if it was put in a studio, I think it would still be a cornerstone attraction today. Right. I, I really think so. Too. Yeah. Now, that was, um, so the story, it, so I, I did both versions of it. So, was, was the story is that Michael came in, Michael Eisner came in and saw it and said, "No, no way! This is like way too much. You've got to tone it down a little bit." And then it was retooled. Is that a true story or is that an urban legend? Well, no. There was there was the original story that was super grim, and then there was and then of course to, to compensate, Imagineering tried to add humor to it, but it, but it was the ultimate. Keep, you know, cornerstone story of something has gone terribly, terribly oh, yeah. wrong. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and then it was retooled. And I think, um, you know, there were a couple of bumbling scientists, and it was, you know, it was testing uh, a technology and a feature. But what was interesting is if you looked at science fiction and what was happening in science fiction, they were starting on this arc where technology really was the villain. You know, so I think in some ways, if we hadn't, even if if we hadn't had it be as scary as it ultimately was, but if we hadn't tried to add humor, but really played on the fact that, you know, technology, and especially some of the places that we're going today, is like, are we really thinking this through? You know, AI. And, um, I remember Terminator when it came out in 1984. My brother came home and told me the entire story at the dinner table, and we were just kind of like, and then, you know, she's sitting in the Jeep, and she's taking the picture, and she's, who's she thinking about? And, oh, it was him. And, you know, we were just like, what in the world is this movie with this story? We were just... <laughs> Just for two hours, he had told us. Then we went to see the movie. We're just like, wow. And uh, little known story, I come from Marietta, Georgia. Robert Patrick and, and my, Robert Patrick's mother, and my mother, grew up together. So then he was in the second Terminator, um, and with the T1000. So like, we were very, very interested in that movie. But the idea that technology could could go wrong in and of itself was a very strong science fiction theme, and I wish I wish Imagineering had really played along with that, rather than add humor. I just was going to add a thing there, in terms of contexting, I think one of the things you would talk about, about it, if it had been in a studio tour, 
one of the things we can do, and oftentimes we don't, is really give the guests a good sense of what they're getting into before they get into it. Right. If you take a little ride like Snow White in Florida, for 25 years we had a sign that says, no, the witch appears three times in this attraction and may scare the children. And that was needed because the front was a beautiful panorama of the castle and I wish you right. had all this <laughs> misdirection. Yeah, so what we, we did in California, you go through a dungeon and we've never had a single complaint on that because right. little kids are weeded out before right. they even get to the queue. <laughs> And I think the alien encounter we had, was it Skippy and the other? Yeah, it was just like this little it was like cute uh, creature, it was really cute, it gets fried. And you're like thinking, oh, well, that Wherever didn't quite go right, but it's funny. The, kid, the park wanted plush animals, yeah. and they couldn't use the thing in the, in right. the cage at the end to make plush out of So they came up with this pre-show yeah, that really kind of threw people off. Well, it was it was a pre-show that uh, Tim Curry did the voice of Sir. Tim right? Curry was the yeah. yeah. Well, actually, I think that we started. With, there was Phil. There was a Phil Hartman version, Phil Hartman. Yep. and then he was replaced by Tim Curry. But Tim Curry was great, and uh, Kevin Pollock and Kathy Nijimney, they were all in it, and and you know they and they were legitimately funny. Uh, but I think again, if you're going to go for scary, go all the way. Yeah. Well, you did, and everybody else went all the way too. <laughs> so, um, you also worked on Mission Space. Yes, Mission Space was my final attraction at Walt Disney World, which is actually really scary when you think the goal of the attraction was to not only give you the real sense of vertical travel, which you can only do through a centrifuge, uh, but it also to give you the sense of what it's like to go into space. And so uh, that is scary. I mean, you know, being someone who got to go to every NASA center and fly all those simulators, you're just like going, these guys are crazy to be doing it. But um, again, a very a, very, a ride that's very much depending on a very strong mechanical element that gives you a sensation that you can't get anywhere else. Yeah. And that feeds perfectly then into the ride vehicle used for Indiana Jones. Yeah. It's Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones. So Indiana Jones, so when I came to actually do Alien Encounter, I can't, I'd come over from Lockheed Martin where I was working. I had been there for a long time working on prototype vehicles. I got hired as a project manager. I got put in Tony's portfolio uh, with Randy Prince. And uh, one of the first things that happened to me is I went to a creative meeting. Now I'm a project manager. So I had, you know, like my slide presentation and I'm dressed in a suit and, you know, like all this kind of stuff. And I go into this meeting and uh, Bruce Gordon, who was one of the great show producers who worked for Tony, and uh, all the designers were sitting at the end of the table. I'm going through all my stuff and I'm explaining how this is all going to be done with precision and attention to safety and blah, 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 blah. And they're all building this, you know, uh, monument out of Coca-Cola cans. And then, like, halfway through my speech, they knocked it down. And I was just like, what's going on? Because, you know, I mean, I'm from Aerosmith. People listen in meetings. And I, I was like, what's happening? What's going on? So uh, Bruce Gordon took me back to Tony's office, and he just said, you're doing it wrong. Um, and he explained to me that there is a creative process by which ideas uh, come out, and good ideas can come at any time along the process, and you can't be so buttoned up. And it was really through working with Tony on Indy that I got into creative, uh, which I totally uh, am so happy about taking that turn in my career. Um, I didn't give up the control of the money either because I'm not stupid. But, uh, uh, but you know, but getting into creative and really understanding how to make something from a blank piece of paper. And so Indiana Jones was a moving simulator through three-dimensional sets. At the time, we really thought other people were working on this, you know, until the, later I look back and think no one was crazy enough to spend as much money as Disney on something like that. But, uh, but the idea was to put you in the footsteps of Indiana Jones. Again, the whole cue is meant to make you uneasy. Um, like you're following him and like, why are we still moving forward? Like you think in the movie, why, are, if, if that just happened, why do we, why do we go back that way? Um, so that was the whole thing was kind of put together like that. And it was really, again, as Phil said, trying to break the envelope, getting things close to you and really put you in that, in that sensation. I think it, also one of the tough things in dealing with management, not you of course, but normal management, <laughs> is we had just delivered something that was stunning, which was the Star Tours simulation thing, which was the first time that had been done in a park. And so they would like to just start manufacturing those. Like, well, this is great, let's do body wars, and we'll use the same thing, and on and on and on. But see, we were like already ahead saying, the really breakthrough thing is adding the component of motion and feeling the kinetics to a ride. Not viewing a movie with 
emotion based, but actually feeling the sensation as you go through something. So it was very hard to convince people, and we bought a cheesy Doran simulator and mm -hmm. strapped it onto a flatbed truck, painted a white line, and got one of those little robots you can get that follow a white line on the ground, and drove it all around in the parking lot and, and proved our point, and that was the beginning. Was so and that, somebody ought to do a book sometime about the mock-up and test process. Right. Yeah. 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 Because these are like crazy, great stories. Sure, and we built, well, uh, we, we built 600 feet of, of Indy up at, across from um, Six Flags, up yeah. in Valencia. I remember when George and Michael came up, George Lucas and Michael Eisner, and they said, let's go over and put flyers on all the cars over at Magic Mountain. The best ride up in the lunch is right here. <laughs> oh, nobody's from the other company. But to bring, to bring that story... Thank you later, Cody, thanks. To bring that story back to these guys here in the middle. So, when I, a year after Indy was open, I was in Florida, and I went on Spider-Man. And I called Marty Sklar, who was the chairman of Adventure, and, and I said, we're no longer the best ride. Because mm -hmm. it was that impressive, bringing that 3D, breaking that plane. I thought, I just love that ride. Well, to that, to the mock-up point, um, I was in the thick of T2-3D when we started up on what was going to be Project X, and I was assigned with a couple of lands, and one of them was superheroes. And Jay, right off the bat, said, Spider-Man has to have a ride. Now, I'm a comic book fan, I'm a Duck Savage fan, I'm, I grew up on Edgar Rice Burroughs, Marvel comic, everything. So the first thing when you think about a superhero like Spider-Man is you've, you've got to break that envelope. You know, you, so as soon as you start thinking about where we're going to go with this, you rule out an animatronic ride like Pirates because, you know, superheroes is in your face. And, and so to be in your face, is you, after a very quick you know, run through in your mind of what you can do, 2D projection, it's like 3D projection. Okay, 3D projection, and we're in the thick of T2-3D, we already started that, we're probably halfway through that, and so I'm, I'm, I come back and say, I think we should do a 3D, 4D ride for Spider-Man, and, and I started working out what it was going to be. And it was a test all along, because a lot of people were saying, this is never going to work, and I was like, it'll work, blah, blah, blah. but what it led to was to prove both two theories at once, which was the three screens 3D, um, what, no matter what seat you're in the house, could you see the three screen T2, and also on a moving ride vehicle. Ours are much more primitive than yours, Tony, but we got a big sound stage, a universal room, and we had three big screens, and we got the projectors for all the screens, and then we had the, all the house, you know, taped down on the floor of the theater for T2-3, and what the best seats and worst seats were, and we let Sid Scheinberg and Jay Stein and, and Phil and everyone sit in these different seats, and everyone was convinced, okay, the three screens work. And all we did was we just got existing 3D footage from other projects and ran them in loops on these on these three screens. Then we had all these little rolling chairs. That's all. Put Sid, Lou, Phil, everybody in these chairs, and we rolled them around <laughs> so that they could see the 3D work from wherever you are. If it hadn't been for that, I don't know that we would have got to finish. But everyone kind of felt, oh, okay, yeah. And, you know, on a very primitive level, it demonstrated that. Even if you're on a moving vehicle, 3D still will work, it'll work. And that's, that was a key moment. It was our cheap, universal version of your, of your truck. I have to tell you my favorite mock-up story. This is yeah. a diversion a little bit, because it's not a dark ride. But when yeah. we were doing Incredible Hulk, you know, we have the catapult. Yeah. The Hulk that had never been done before, where we went off the catapult directly down. And there's a lot of technical difficulties with that. But we also wanted to test and see how many Gs did we need to get on that. So literally, we built a track, uh, built a steel structure, and put two cargo containers on the end of it, put a go-kart with wheels on it, and strung a cable on the go-kart over a shiv with two big railroad tied railroad wheels as a weight, and calculated the amount of G-forces that we would get when you pulled the pin on the weight and it fell into a hay bale. And we literally, this is how stupid we were. <laughs> People sat in that go-kart with a helmet on. And somebody would pull the pin and we'd go. Oh yeah. My back, I swear, is still sore from that. This is how great attractions get made. Well, my, my big question is, are there pictures of all these mock-up things? Yeah. Well, in, a, in, in about 48 hours, I'm going to need a new project, so... Uh, maybe we'll do a mock-up book, huh? because this hour is coming to a full and complete stop pretty soon here. What I want to do is open it up to a few questions. I'm sure a few of you have some questions for these guys. Now is your time. 
Hands up if you have questions for the panel. Hello, uh, I'm Josh, big fan of Tony. I have a question for Susan. Uh, with a, uh, with an uh, uh, alien encounter being in Florida, do you think it'd be a better chance of having it in California since we're local? Well, it was actually designed for California. It was designed as part of Tomorrowland 2055, if you can say those, those words, which was a, a Tomorrowland concept that was um, designed here for Florida. It was designed to go into the old Mission to Mars attraction, if you remember that, if you're from Southern California. Right? The pizza port, for those of you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. pizza port now. Uh, and so, yeah, it was heartbreaking to see it go to Florida uh, because it was designed for this. And Tomorrowland 2055, was um, interrupted by Mr. Eisner, I believe. Well, he Michael had a really interesting thing. He said, you know, how do you design the future when the future is Montana? Right. We were meeting with General Motors, who immediately wrote that down, and six months later there was a Montana truck available on the marketplace. But, uh, no, he had a point. Like, if people have enough money, they don't want to live in a Blade Runner right. or science fiction city. They want to live out in the forest and commute with the Internet. All right, who's next? Uh, Hand back here. Yeah. Want the You hold it, okay. So my question is, for each of you, what do you think is like a real simple way of putting it, the difference between, uh, that limit between amusement and terror? I mean, you've covered some of it of letting the audience know what's coming, but is there anything that you kind of use as your own little personal formula? when you're designing a traction, you go, this is too far, or you know what, we need to add more humor to it. That's mm -hmm. a general question for all of you. Yeah, I, I'd say, when I was going to school here in Long Beach, anyone from Long Beach State? <laughs> we had a thing called the Tactile Symposium, which took sight away from you, and you had to find your way through a maze where it was just what you could feel and whatnot, and it was an altered perception of the world. We also put some blind students through that who experienced it the way they normally experience the world. And while I was frightened to death, and there was a room, for instance, that had no exit, unless you fell below the three-foot level, and there was a perfect door going out. But we're conditioned to go all around feeling at eye level. And uh, so I, I learned at that point that a lot of this can be this thing of altering the reality, and it can be done with characters, it can be done I think most effectively on a ride, like Indiana Jones, the ending, we have given you the perspective that you're backing up and that the ball is coming towards you when in fact you're rolling forward and you're rising in the room and you think you're going down. And so at the very last minute, we've got you up about three feet off of the base of that and then wham, the thing drops down and the ball appears to go over you. And that came from a car wash. You sit in a car wash and the thing runs around you and you go, wow, it feels like I didn't put my car in park, you know? And so you look for these things where the world that we see is altered because your brain is programmed to see things in a certain way. And if you can deliver something that violates those rules, it's always disorienting, as Susan said, for the, for the guests and fun. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that uh, John Hench used to always, uh, I think, drum into us was the, the Disney, the thing about Disney was that you always felt that you were safe. Even in moments when you're supposed to be a little scared, underneath, subconsciously, you know you're safe. So it's safe thrills, safe uh, adventures, and uh, I, think, I think at Disney, one of the reasons we broke away from that Universal was we realized that. We realized that, at least at that time, Disney their things had to be relatively passive and had to be uh, for all ages and because of who their audience was, the mindset. So at Universal, right after we finished Conan, uh, I remember having an Ewan Jay and saying, you know, this is, we've, we've fallen into something cool here. Real fire, real water, real pyrotechnics, putting people in, in a place with a sense of danger which they can't do or won't do at Disney. And if you look at what happened after that, from King Kong all the way on through, you know, T2, Spider-Man, everything, I think it's been a journey at Universal to try and put you more and more and more in the middle of things, in the midst of things, immerse you in things, to where you actually feel at times like, well, whoa, this, this is on the edge of possibly being dangerous, you know? And I think at one point, at by Spider-Man, as, as was pointed out earlier, I think, uh, I think that was a wake-up call in a good way for Disney, that they've got to push further. So I think, I think this 
competition between Universal and Disney is actually good. It pushes the industry you know, forward. But uh, the answer to the specific question is, uh, I think that in most family theme parks, you're, you're never going to approach the point of terror. We could, anyone here could, could design a terror ride um, and scare the living crap out of you. But you're not going to do that in a, in a family theme park. It's not to that level you're talking about. I, I think there's, I mean, there's a primal need to confront fear and terror and thrill. That's why you're all here and why people love roller coasters, because it is that sense of flirting with uh, death, actually. Um, and, and it's going right up to the edge, um, and maybe even a little above that. You know, we, we, in uh, vehicle design, we look about acceleration curves and things like that. And you can take the Find a large G-force load if you don't maintain it too long. Well, it's the same thing with fear, I think. You know, you can push it and actually go a little bit over what anybody would feel really comfortable doing, but then you have to stop right at the right moment and probably give you some relief, humor or something that says it's really okay and, and, and some quick reassurance. But we want to be right up on that edge, and it's just a matter of sort of seeing how far over the cliff you can hang. Um, before that's you called, that one little comment. Eddie Salado called it a little formula he had. Fear, Fear minus, minus death, death equals thrill. <laughs> so, as someone who maybe didn't realize there was a line that you're not supposed to You cross, so broke the rule. Uh, I actually worked on, you, you may not remember this, but Disney bought um, the Weinstein Company, Fear Max, and one of their franchises was called Scream. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. <laughs> And so I was given the assignment to come up with an attraction for the Scream franchise. Which, it's a non-stop uh, roller coaster of, of, of you know, uh, yeah, right. Um, so we were looking at what kind of ride system could deliver that type of adrenaline that you get sitting in a movie theater. And we were over in Europe, I believe we were in London, and we're looking at this ride. It was a roller coaster, and when you got to the top of a 180-foot drop, the cars came over one by one, by one by one, until like all of them were hanging there, and then it let you go. And we were like, "This is the thing for Scream." So it was like a, it was a coaster you were on, and then you went in, the, and then you went into a, a you know kind of a magic mirror fun house. But it was really that moment of like, how could you, how can you re reproduce what we feel in the movie theater when you know there, anything can happen on the screen? It's like, and a lot of it's through mechanics. To go back to that thing. We did a concept for Screen 2. It was, we, we called it Screen 3D, basically. And we took you into a uh, deserted, uh, a, what was a deserted theme park, and into a theater. And uh, the movie starts to play, and we actually were going to have the stars, Courtney, Courtney Cox, I'm worried. Um, and uh, halfway through the film, a shadow is going to start appearing on the screen. And we're going to start really messing with what's 3D and what's real, whatever. The climactic, to get to the climactic moment. Uh, the screen character, the killer in this thing, in 3D, suddenly a knife points, pokes through the screen dead center and rips the screen open and he comes out. But it's a live performer on a cable, on a cable rig. So he comes, ooh, I'm out of here, you know, over the house. Anyway, so we developed the concept too for that way back. That's interesting. Point. That's it. And just like any great e ticket attraction, this is over just when it's getting good, right, kids? So I know we can. I want to thank our family, Tony Baxter, Sarah Goddard, Phil Hedemann, Susan Goddard, and you guys so much. It really is kind of like that. Thank you guys so much. And that's it, kids. Thank you. Have a great time at Midsummer Summer Street. To re enter the theater for the next presentation, please go outside the theater and re line up in the appropriate lines. Thank you.